Dr. Geoffrey Mutale again from SARS Healthcare Center. You're very welcome, doctor. Thank you. And he's going to be talking to us about these things. What you need to know. Is it normal to have a painful period or is it abnormal? I mean, at what stage does it push you to a hospital? At what stage do you stay home? And all those things. Doctor, you are welcome. Thank you, Fiona. Yes. And uh, just like she has introduced, we are going to be talking about this menorrhea or what we call painful periods. Yes. Yes, I think it's something common. It's very common. It's a common complaint that uh, people are always having about painful periods. Yes. And then we need to know, is it a disease? Is it a disease or a condition? <laughs> or Is it normal? Mm -hmm. mm. And in the first case, is it normal to have periods? I think it is normal. It is very normal. Very, very normal. Actually, when you don't have them... That, uh, is, that is an abnormal that condition That is an abnormal now. condition. Yes. So, having pain during your period, it's normal. Mm. But this pain should be minimal pain, not excessive, and shouldn't be severe pain. Mm. And then this pain should last for some period of time. It shouldn't go on and on. Mm. Otherwise, it, be, it could be mistaken. It will be dysmenorrhea or pain during uh, periods when it is an infection or some other condition, mm. a, a disease. Mm. So we are going to be looking at details. How do we differentiate yes. dysmenorrhea from other pains that we feel? Which and for starters, is dysmenorrhea, is it a condition or mm. is it a disease? It's not a disease. It is just a condition which comes most times when you are about to start your period or during your period. Mm. Yes, that's when it comes. Okay. So what is a dysmenorrhea exactly? Mm -hmm. We have said it is a pain during the menstrual, menstrual period. period. Yes. So this pain or dysmenorrhea is categorized into two. Mm -hmm. There's what we call the primary dysmenorrhea mm -hmm. and then we have the secondary dysmenorrhea. Mm -hmm. So primary dysmenorrhea, this is the pain you get, or oh, a woman who is going to the menstrual period gets mm. as a result of some contraction of the uterine contractions. Mm. You know, during menstru menstruation, I think we need to explain this in details. People need to know what mm. menstruation is mm -hmm. because some are men <laughs> and <laughs> they don't know exactly what will happen. Mm. But their girlfriends so or their wives are always complaining mm. and they may need to get exactly what does this mean exactly, what mm. does it mean. So what do we mean by menstrual period or this menstrual cycle? Mm. Every woman, every month, the body prepares mm. for fertilization to take a place or for a probable pregnancy mm. to take a place. Mm. So when the pregnancy does not take a place, that egg which is produced by the ovaries is supposed to be shed off. Mm. But in the process of preparing, for the body preparing, mm. the uterus lining also prepares Also itself. prepares. Mm. The muscles will thicken. There will be an increment in the blood flow. Mm -hmm. So once implantation, when you talk about implantation, we mean the fertilized egg now attaching itself to the uterus so mm. that the baby grows. Mm. So in case implantation has not taken place, and when there has not been any fertilization, mm. the body will have to signal the uterus that please, no conception has taken place or no fertilization. So, this shed card. off, yes, mm. what you had prepared for the baby is not going to be needed it's not anymore. Going to be need anymore. Mm. So, what happens is, is that that lining mm. and the increased blood supply in the uterus is then which is shed off. So together with Along the egg, with that uh -huh. uh, egg that is not fertilized. Exactly. Okay. So in the process of now shedding off that wall mm -hmm. and releasing the egg, there are some contractions. The yeah. muscles, the of, muscles the of the uterus have to contract so that they can push out the excess lining together mm -hmm. with the egg. Mm -hmm. So there is a chemical which is produced in the body, in the ovary. I mean, in the uterus, mm. and that's because what we call the prostaglandin is the one which is responsible for the contractions of the muscles. Yes, of the muscles, and that contraction is that which causes the cramps or what you're calling the pain. The pain. Yes. So when the muscles are contracting, in the process of expelling out all that, in that mm. process, you feel pain. You feel pain. Mm. So 
it is normal in that case because it's, it's the process normal. has to take a place there has to be some construction so that the rest that can be pushed out okay but the severity of the pain mm. will depend on the quantity of the of that chemical, chemical produced, produced in the body the higher the that concentration or the amount of the prostaglandin mm. then the severe the contraction is and it's uh, 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 to feel the pain also mm. harder mm. so feeling pain during or a few days to your menstrual period is normal it's, it's normal. not a disease because it has to happen okay mm. there is something called a pre premenstrual syndrome okay premenstrual syndrome is also not a disease does it also comes along with a pain no it doesn't come along with it but at times uh, there, are, and there are people who get pain you may get some pain but uh, it's quite different from uh, what you've been talking about oh, okay yes so this is a syndrome just, just like a signs that is which your body you. presents alerting you to that you're very soon getting into mm. your menstrual period okay. so, this so that one is mild i think yeah it may mild to some people it goes extreme mm. because it can be coupled with mood swings some but people become unruly. Eh? Still, that, that chemical you've talked about is responsible for that. Yes, as well. because what happens is what causes the mood swings and the, the premenstrual syndrome is actually the changes in the hormones. When there's a hormone changes, and then you begin to feel weirdly. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there is increase in body temperature. Mm. The mood swings, people become, sometimes they don't want to associate with people, they become moody, they become unruly. Mm. Mm. Those mood swings, those are the syndromes, actually. Mm. Okay. But you may not feel pain at that moment, mm. or you may. Okay. Mm. You might or you may or not. Yes, you may okay. or you may not. Now you were talking about the primary dysmenorrhea. Mm. What, how do you differentiate the primary from the secondary? For primary dysmenorrhea, now in the first case, primary dysmenorrhea comes a few days before you get into your periods, and it, it will definitely cease once your periods are done or once you start your periods, mm. it will go away. And also the cause is different. Mm -hmm. That's where we're going to, how to differentiate between the primary and then the secondary. And the secondary, yeah. Primary, we talked about the primary dysmenory as being caused by the other chemical prostaglandin. Mm. But now when it comes to secondary mm. dysmenorrhea, it is caused by other conditions, which could be either diseases, mm -hmm. one, or some other pathologies in the body. Mm. And one of them, we have a condition, what we call endometriosis. Okay. Endometriosis, this is a condition where the lining of the ovary, I mean of the uterus, the uterus yeah. grows to other parts of the pelvis. Uh -huh. it, may go out, it may grow outside in the uterus and to separate to the fallopian tubes or to the ovaries. Now, how does the lining of the uterus start growing from? It's an abnormality. It's an abnormality. Yeah, that's why it, mm. this is now not normal. Mm. Yeah. The first one we are talking about, it was a normal process. Mm. But now this one is an abnormality. The mm. secondary dysmenorrhea is actually an abnormality. Mm. Because it's caused by factors which are not normal. Mm -hmm. Now, like this condition of endometriosis, mm. imagine the lining of the uterus growing in other parts of the pelvis where it's not supposed to grow. True. Yes. Mm -hmm. And when it grows there, during, due to hormonal changes still, mm. uh, it may also bleed in the process of trying to be shed. Wherever it is wherever in it the is, body. Yes, wherever it is in the body. And in that process, it can cause scars or adhesions of the organs. Because it is not shed off? No. In the process of getting shed off, it can create something like wounds. Okay. And scars can develop from, so in the other, yeah, body from parts. other body parts. Okay. So in the process of healing, it can cause the scars and adhesion. Mm, when yeah. the scars are yes, and you can find adhesion of other organs in the body. Uh, so when the scars attach themselves to the other organs, exactly, of the and body. that process it becomes painful. Um. It is a painful process. That's where people feel a lot of pain. For secondary dysmenorrhea, it is more severe mm. and more painful than the primary. Than the primary one. Exactly, it is more severe. And it takes longer than, because it can even go on even after 
the, the periods. periods. Why? Because the other abnormality still mm. does exist. It does exist in the other body parts. Exactly. So the, the pain continues because of the scarring. Yes. And the adhesions and that come along it. with it. Exactly. Okay. So it can continue being there. Then another condition which may cause that is what we are going to talk about in ahead and mm. that those are the fibroids. Okay. If you have fibroids they can also cause pain and that's also another abnormality mm. fibroids are not normal they're not normal so it, fibroids are also classified in the secondary yeah they also find in the secondary dysmenorrhea mm. primarily the what we talked about in the first one is the normal yeah is the normal but now the secondary these are all abnormalities how long does a normal cycle run a normal a regular normal Mm. How long is it supposed to run? Actually, it depends on the individual, mm. but it ranges between 21 days to 35 days. Mm. Yes. So if it is beyond 35 days or less than 21 days... That is abnormal. That's abnormal. Exactly, that's abnormal. Then how long does a period have to run? Standard. A, a standard one. Mm. It's also this an average. We cannot say it must be strictly one day or two or three days. Mm. But the average is between three to eight days. Three to eight days. Then. Uh, people go get their periods between eight, I mean between thirty and eight days. Mm. Then it is averaged that at least, at most, mm. maybe mm. it should be five days. Okay. Yes. At most. So if it is mm. more than five days, yes, there are chances of getting those conditions. You yes. About? Actually, those are signs. Those are signs of. If you have your periods for abnormally long days, mm. it is a sign that there could be some. Abnormal condition. Abnormal condition. It's like the ones we've been talking about. You could be having some adhesions in the body caused by endometriosis. Mm -hmm. Are you getting that? By mm -hmm. the, the by the dysmenorrhea. The dysmenorrhea causes no the fibroids. The fibroids. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. what I was getting off my head. The fibroids. Mm -hmm. So having prolonged the periods is not a problem itself. But, but it is a sign mm -hmm. that there is something not going on well in, your, in body. your body. Yeah, that's a simple sign. There should be something causing it. And if it is even less, say less S than still the same days, time. still, the same, still time. the same. Yes. You know, some of these changes are caused by factors, now like uh, hormonal changes, mm. because the menstrual cycle is completely regulated by hormones. a cascade of hormones. Mm. So once there are changes in one or two, hormones then there could be changes in the cycle and then they will bring about this condition and then they will bring about other conditions that may come with that mm. somebody may continue bleeding as a result of some changes in the hormones mm. when it is not even about other things mm. or somebody may have quite short periods or you have repeated mm. periods mm. you go off your period and again you get into it mm. simply because of some changes apart from that we have what we call the PIDs these are pelvic inflammatory mm. diseases actually these are infections of either the uterus the varicose tube and the ovaries mm. infection is the normal infection that we always talk about mm. tra sexually transmitted infections they can also cause the Such pain. Yeah, they can cause the pain. Mm. Because these are infections, they inflame. They'll cause the inflammation to the ovary, they mm. cause inflammation to the uterus, they cause inflammation to the follicle. And by the way, if they are not attended to, mm. they can cause infertility. Mm. Yes. Because if they get to the ovary, they get the fallopian tubes and the fallopian tubes are inflamed, mm -hmm. they may cause some scarring or blockage, yes. In the fallopian tubes. Yes. And once the tubes are blocked, mm. This means once the egg is released from the ovary, mm. it cannot slope down to meet the sperm and the fertilization takes place. Mm. Or if it managed to get in touch with the sperm and was fertilized, it may not be able to move down to mm. the uterus and get implanted. So that automatically will make you not to conceive. Of course. Yes. Now, what does a parent, at, at what stage does this malaria start? Like if a parent is seated there, how do they notice that mm, mm. maybe my child is suffering this or maybe the condition has worsened mm. too? As long as you are in the puberty stage, as long as you have started menstruating, it can start as it early can as start. that. There is no minimum time that it will strictly begin at this time. Mm. No. But like for primarily this menorrhea, mm. it is more common for younger girls. Mm. Yes, it, those are like uh, risk stages. If you're below 20, you're at 
you have high chances of suffering of suffering from that and then for women who have not conceived yet mm. yeah such chances are high and then some things are habitual mm. what you eat and what you do this is going, I was going to ask going to ask <laughs> is there anything in particular that you would eat or maybe a lifestyle that can spark off this malaria not in our mind off, but uh, it can help you to relieve the pain Oh, there are things you can eat. Yes, but some things you which put you at risk, like uh, drinking excessively, smoking, those ones put you at risk. Mm. But then there are some other habits or some activities you do that can help you to relieve, apart from the medication. Mm. But if you're doing some yoga exercises mm. that can relieve you or from the pain. Uh, actually, exercising, doing exercise more so. Keeping your body physically, physically fit. active. Can, yes, can physically help. fit and doing exercise during your menstrual period is also very good to relieve your such, such pain. Mm. Mm. Okay. What, what treatments are there that, 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 um, that can be given to relieve? Because you'd find an instance, as, as reading on, on internet, mm. that with some people it is too severe to one extent that they are admitted. It is true. And there, there are some that have medic, they are given medication, but the condition, I mean, you get to a point and you just have to learn to live with it. Mm -hmm. Yes. So what kind of treatments are there that, that can be given in such instances? Actually, in the first case, remember we said it's not a disease. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a condition. So we cannot say that there is something curative to mm -hmm. that, but you are given some reliefs. Mm. like painkillers mm. yes in the first instances now like for primary dysmenorrhea mm. so you're given painkillers mm. but uh, there is no such actually the management of it will depend on the cause okay mm. so the management of it will depend on on, oh yeah, on the cause of on, it on the cause of it can its management go along with the cause if the cause is let's say the hormone mm. can you suppress the hormone that's the possible actually for hormonal treatment is possible actually what is given mm. we, are, we are given the oral family planning pills the contraceptives the contraceptives mm. they can help you to live on that pain and then the non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs these mm. are the ones we call in the painkillers mm. like aspirin diclofenac ibuprofen but then this should be taken with caution Mm. Actually, our viewers out there, mm -hmm. don't just hear this and then you go to the account and buy. Because I was going to tell you, many people mm. tend to self-medicate. Eh? That's They wrong. know at this time of the month, mm. I think I'll need like two strips of brufen. Actually, what you need to do, you need to do this under caution mm. with a consultation with your doctor. Because if you're reactive or if you're sensitive like to aspirin, you should not take. Mm. And if you have some stomach problems, if you have ulcers, then some medication you shouldn't take. Like now like diclofenac. You shouldn't. So, it should be under the guidance of a technical person. So, even with this condition, you need to see a medical yes, practitioner you need to see before you start on medication. But you know what happens mm. is uh, parents tend to to give their children medicine. I have a, like say you would say I have a child that is in senior two or senior one mm. or P seven, and they're in their period. So I'll give them just a pack of painkillers. I tell them swallow two times three a day. You'll be fine. Take them for three days. You'll mm. be fine. Mm. And as a child grows, they tend to start self medicating. Mm. They they buy the drugs themselves mm. because maybe at times mommy is not there or auntie has traveled or something. Then I need to just get the medicine for myself. Mm. Yes. Actually, what I can say on that, that sometimes we are just lucky mm. that when we self-medicate ourselves, God protects us in one way or the other, <laughs> that by <laughs> because coincidence, we yeah. may take the correct medicine, mm. but it shouldn't be something that we should go by. At least for any kind of medicine, for any kind, mm. if you're not a professional, if you're not a medical professional, mm. it would be very prudent to take any kind of medication under the guidance. Oh. of a professional practitioner. medical practitioner exactly mm. because you may not know now like what i've been talking about you may be reactive to some drugs and you don't know. you could be having a liver problem and mm. you're busy taking the diclofenac mm. and the rest of the drug that wouldn't be right it may cause some other severe effects than the simple pain you're feeling mm. so it's better for any kind of medication mm. by the way even the panado because i think panado is the kind of drug which is consumed by yeah, anybody, somebody will look to the counter and buy and Panadol. Buy Panadol. 
but Panadol may be very dangerous to you mm. if you abused it. Mm. Very, very dangerous. Mm. It can kill you in a very short time. Mm. Yes. And I, I, okay, in my mind, in my mm. thinking, mm. or oh, I would be speaking for many people if we say that Panadol is, uh, is, is the first painkiller anyone can run to. It's very easy to get. Mm. It's even sold in shops. Not not mm. drug shops, not drug shop. not uh, but a grocery shop mm. or even a supermarket. You mm. walk in mm. and buy medicine. Mm. Yes, you buy Panadol and then you take it. Yes, people do that, mm. but that's wrong. Did you know that Panadol can kill you in four days if you took an overdose? I, okay, if you took an overdose, yes. Yes, but in just four days, your liver will not be functioning. It will completely be dead, and mm. because your liver is dead, you will automatically die. Wow. In four days, four days will be no more. So that's why we say every kind of drug, mm. irrespective of which kind of condition you're treating, mm. at least try to guide the guidance of a medical profession before mm. you take that medicine. Because you need to know, apart from the pain you feel, you could be having other, other underlying symptoms. conditions mm. which could be worsened by taking such a kind of drug. So when you meet a physician, when you meet a doctor, when you meet a nurse, when you meet a pharmacist, and you explain to that person, these people are in a position to guide you. Mm. It's fine, you want ABCD, but based on this and the other, mm. we shall not give you the clofenac, yes, no. but we are going to give you ibuprofen. Mm. For some reason is, they know. They know. Are you getting that? Mm. Instead of just going, they are all painkillers, fine, but, but you need to take them only when they are recommended to you. So are there particular painkillers, like particular painkillers that are associated to this condition? They may not be specifically that these ones are strictly associated with this because they are all painkillers, mm. but it will be based on what? On the kind of pain? No, not the kind of pain, mm. but on your other, other conditions. underlying conditions. Because like what you're talking about, if you have ulcers, it wouldn't be prudent for you or for any physician to prescribe for diclofenac. Then somebody will give you some other alternative, like maybe profen. But if you didn't have ulcers, then it is okay. Mm. So there are no painkillers that are strictly limited to treating this menorrhea. No, mm. no something like that. Now, mm. when, when someone has that condition, mm. how do they differentiate um, abdominal pain mm. from cramps? from cramps okay now how would you differentiate one these cramps may not be as that severe mm. as other abdominal pains which could be as a result of maybe PIDs or other infections are you getting that mm. then secondly how long does it go on how long does the pain yes go on? for the cramps they'll, they'll disappear once the period is gone or once mm. you start your period it will definitely go because they already started prior you prior getting into the periods, but once you're over it, mm. then they are, you shouldn't expect any more cramps if you're out of the periods. Mm. But if you feel this pain persisting, and then that means it could be another condition. thing, another condition, but mm. not necessarily the cramps or this menorrhea. That mm. could be something different. Mm. Are you getting that? Mm. So, those are the things we should be looking at. We should not simply look at the pain, but how long does it go on? Mm. If it takes long, and then there are other factors which may come, it may be followed up by either discharge, mm -hmm. the first sm smell, mm -hmm. and then backache, mm -hmm. and other conditions like a fever, because this is not supposed to cause you fever. <laughs> so it's supposed to be something normal. You yeah. Live with, go to work, go to school, yes. do whatever it is you're doing. But if this pain goes on like that, then it could be something else. But still, not still concluding that it could be an infection, mm. uh, but it could be the secondary dysmenorrhea. Because remember, the causes now we talked about are still existing. Because if you had a fibroid, it is still existing. So if you don't deal with it... If you don't deal with it, that's why we said last time that how to manage dysmenorrhea may specifically be related to what the cause is. Mm. Because to some extent, you may need even to go for surgery. For, for this menorrhea? Yes. Mm. Okay. Some could be surgically treated. Tr yes. Because 
Now we talked now, about wait. endometriosis. Okay, mm. wait. You're talking about <laughs> surgical treatment for dysmenorrhea. <laughs> what are you, what exactly are they going to? Because we we normally know when there is a surgery, there's a correction or something. Are you going to correct mm -hmm. the the uterus, mm. the walls? Mm. The, what exactly would be done? Because I mean, this is something that happens monthly. It's a cycle that goes on. Mm. So. Why is it that to some extent you have to even do surgery for That's it? That's why I'm saying that it depends on the cause. Now we're imagining this menorrhea being caused by the fibroid. Okay. Yeah, because that is something which will be surgically removed. There, there's, you not, there's no other treatment. Yeah, that will have to be cut out. So surgically removed. So when it is removed? Then it will give you the relief. Because what happens when these tumors or what you call the fibroids will grow, mm. they may grow on different sites. Mm. They may either grow in the muscle of the uterus, mm. those are the ones we call the intram intramural mm -hmm. fibroids. Mm -hmm. It may grow inside mm. the lining of the uterus or outside, so it can grow anywhere. Mm. So once it grows there, it will exert pressure on the uterus. On the uterus. Mm. That's one. It will cause an inflammation and definitely will cause pain. So if it's not removed, it will continue exerting the pressure and causing the pain. Okay. So the only way out for it is Isn't getting away with it okay mm. we are going in for a short break and when we come back we are going to get to know more about these things did you know that there's a surgical treatment for dysmenorrhea well i didn't but now i have learned we'll know all that when we come back <laughs> program wa msomesa wa Nukres TV bulirwa kutano esawa bili paka sawa satwe zechiro tukuletiro msomesa olambo msomesa kusomoza chikwe basanga bichibye bakolango jeko kusomesa tugenda kubanga tukuletira abasomesa abenja ulo mugwanga ba historical na aba valley system abava amweda wa Nukres TV bulirwa kutano sawa bili paka sawa satwe zechiro nango mwele zao katongo le isakats okujikutusa Julia Mega Praise Gospel Festival! Omkwano chinchirunji era fenna tuyayana okwagalibwa esanyu bichi livu eliberawo ngomchala achaza omwami we mu makaga bakadebe obanga mwami no mchala bagatibwa mu bufumbo obutukuvu twayonge kono wano ku rest tv mu program the bridal magazine yatukuletera emikolo ejembaga sako nejo kwanjira okono nga kota de anembozi za bagalana nabatu totolera obuwonvu no buko obuli mu mkwano nango muwerezawo wonen sara okuva ku sawa 12 eza kaongezi paka sawe mu bulira sande tasubwa
all come back from that break and before we went for the break <laughs> was something interesting we learned that they can do surgery for dysmenorrhea but um as much as they can doctor was still talking about the different kinds of fibroids mm. that you'd say talking about yeah, okay that are associated I think all of them are associated with this yes. menorrhea because it's a condition, like you said. Mm -hmm. So you are still explaining about this, what they do to, to the uterus. Mm -hmm. Yes. Actually, they are not different types of fibroids, but they, these are fibroids which go, grow in at different, different locations. Different locations, yes. yes. Like the ones we call the intramural, these are the ones who grow in the muscle mm. of the uterus. Mm. Then we have uh, the submucosal. Uh, these are the, are the ones actually which you grow inside and then the subceroso these are the ones which you grow outside mm. but they are all not supposed to be there in the first case so there is no kind of uh, fibroid which is normal they are all abnormal they are all abnormal because they're not actually supposed to be there mm. because they can interfere apart from causing the pain mm. they can also make you infertile mm. they may feel the conception to take a place mm -hmm. because like now the Submucosal, the ones that grow that inside, grow inside. The mm. they may interfere with the process of uh, implantation. The fertilized egg may fail to attach itself to the uterus, and in that case, the baby can't grow in the uterus. So, there is nothing which is good for that case, it's not supposed to be there. So, besides infertility, yeah, they can also cause miscarriages. Yes, they can, mm. they can, they can lead you to having bleeding severely, having severe bleeding, mm. they can cause you to have preterm birth. Mm. Mm. The ones we call the premature babies, mm. you produce your baby. Not at time, but at when, time. yes, but the, the pre time is it, is it because uh, the fibroid would be fighting for space? Exactly, for that's one of them. Mm -hmm. That's one of them because these fibroids can grow. Fibroids they can be from as small to the extent they cannot be even seen by naked eye, mm. and some can grow even big and fill up like a ball. Yes, like a ball. They can be very big. So imagine when the fibroid has grown that big. Mm. Because sometimes if it grows back, even when you palpate your stomach, you can still feel it. You can feel it. Yes, you can feel oh. when it has grown so big. Uh -huh. So imagine it occupying as competing for space with your baby. Mm. When the baby can still, if the baby manages to grow to term, the baby could be underweight, very small baby. Mm. A lot of factors apart from causing the pain. Let, let so, me ask, let me ask, let yes. me interject you briefly there. Mm. Let me ask, what exactly makes a fibroid grow? Now, what exactly makes a fibroid grow? Mm. One, some fibroids they may grow without an, any known cause. So it just keeps increasing. On That's space. one. It keeps growing, getting yeah. bigger and bigger. That's one. Mm -hmm. It may grow when the cause is not known. Mm. Secondly, a fibroid may grow as a result of a gene change. Of? A gene, a gene, what you would call mutation. Mm -hmm. You know, there are cells in the uterus. Mm -hmm. So if there are some genetic changes, then the cells of the uterus can, chew, ca can begin to grow abnormally. Mm. When they grow abnormally, not in the same way like other cells in the uterus, and they develop into a fibroid. Is there something that can cause... Uh a change in that in, in 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 like in the genetic cells no. growing or something. yes because mutation is caused by a number of factors one it could be exposure to some chemicals mm -hmm. exposure to some radiations then some mutation is just to come a mutation this is something which happens to the gene without any cause mm. from nowhere and this is common in the cancers yeah, like in cancer cells, that because most of they, the cancers, that rapid growth. yes, most of the cancers have no known cause, mm. because they just happen from nowhere. Mm. The cells just transform, and they become unruly. That's what I think I can use that basic term. Mm. They don't grow like the rest of the cells, mm. and they grow very fast. Mm. And when these cells, which have become unruly, grow, they even become immortal. What do you mean by become immortal? That they don't die. Because mm -hmm. naturally, the cells of the body are supposed to die, and the body creates, creates new, new ones. ones. Automatically, there is that system that cells have to be there for some period of time, and then after they are shed off, and then the body creates new ones. But in the cases of those mutated cells, mm. they become immortal and they grow very fast. So, to some extent, one of the causes of uh, the fibroid is that that if there are some gene changes or mm. some mutations some cells may grow abnormally mm. and 
then turn into the fibroids. The fibroids. Yeah, that's the second cause. Then another cause, it could be hormonal. Mm. Increase the production or secretion of uh, some hormones like uh, progesterone, mm. I mean o oestrogen and mm. then progestin. Mm. They can also cause, it can be a predisposing factor to the development of, so of, of the fibroids. Mm. Yes, and any other factor, it can come automatically. Mm. So fibroids are not normal, mm. yes, in that case. So uh, just in case a fibroid is surgically removed, mm. what are the chances of a regrowth? Oh, I don't know what I can say, the chances of regrowth, but there is a possibility that it can regrow and if at the same the, time... If the cause... Exactly, now you Yes. It can regrow. It's not a permanent solution. I cannot say that when it is removed, it doesn't mean another one can't grow. It can grow as long as... You have not dealt with the root cause. Yes. Okay. Are you getting that? Yeah. Yes. It can grow. So... Many people have gone for surgical procedures mm. to remove the fibroids mm. and then the fibroids still come. come. Most of all, for people who are above 30. Mm. Actually, if you are above 30, yes, and you have not uh, conceived yet mm. or you have never given birth, you are at high chances, those are risk factors, mm. you are at high chances of developing fibroids. Okay. Anybody. I'm not saying. <laughs> 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 Somebody should <laughs> misquote us there. Someone should not rush to conceive. Exactly. Eh? Uh, yeah. But you, but you should know that you follow. You fall under the yeah the, that the, risk the group. The risky eh? group where uh, you're most likely to get such kind of problems. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Does an endometriosis come after fibroid, or it can come on its it own? It can come on its own. It does not necessarily need the fibroid to come because it is a condition on its own. Uh. Mm. It is an ab other ab abnormality of its own. And can it be corrected? Yes, Medically. it can be corrected. You know, just like I was saying, mm. there are other investigations that you can actually do to find out because now you're talking about endometriosis. Mm. How will you know that you have endometriosis? If that is what I was going to get to. Yeah. Uh, what, 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 uh, how do you test for? Now, like for that, you need to how do some... Do you, do you, what tests are done actually to, 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 to find the cause of dysmenorrhea or fibroids or mm -hmm. endometriosis? And even for fibroids, you may not actually know mm. just based on the pain you're feeling, but you need to do some other investigation. You need to do a scan mm -hmm. and the scan you look at your uterus and definitely identify mm. yeah, those fibroids in the case they are there and even their sizes, they can mm. be measured. You may need to do a laparoscopy to look at uh, the look in the that cavity, goes in yes. Look into the cavity. Yes, yeah, small incision is made uh, on your pelvic region. Then it is inserted with a camera, and you can you can look into look at those organs mm. to see whether there is there are adhesions or inflammations on mm. the ovary or on the fallopian tubes and the uterus. So you can do a CT scan, mm. you can do an MRI. All those investigations can be done to really look at that and see. Uh, now, mm. once they are done, mm. like for this menorrhea, mm. what alternative? Uh, okay, besides doing a scan, because I mean you just can't go for a scan because you you have uh, or for a scan to tell you that you know what you mm. have painful periods. Mm. It's a scan. What other examinations would be done? Because there are some people that have them the pain on and off. This mm. month it's there. And then it comes back after four months. Mm. Then it doesn't come at all. Actually, I, I don't see that once you feel the pain, you should automatically go. Mm. And then you begin doing such investigations. But what you need to do for any pain, even when it is not a menstrual pain or dysmenorrhea as such, mm. you need to go and see a doctor. You explain the doctor. Then the doctor will recommend for you the appropriate investigation you need to mm. do. Not simply feeling the pain and then go. Immediately because the pain may not be necessarily mm -hmm. as a result of uh, dysmenorrhea as such, but it could be as a result of an, other conditions like a PID mm -hmm. or other infections as mm -hmm. such. So when you go and see a doctor or a physician, they will make a pelvic examination and take your history mm -hmm. to find out what you've been going through, how did this pain start, for mm -hmm. how long has it been there, and other questions that they may ask you. They ask you questions to do with your family because some of the things may be family related. Yeah, I was going to ask, isn't it related anywhere in the family yes, line that maybe if your mm. four parents or ancestors or whatever have a history of that, couldn't it run? It can't. It's very possible. If in your family have history of such, 
and then you you stand such risks of also having the same conditions mm. so that's the issue that any doctor would take before he makes any recommendation for you mm. that's why we tell our viewers that please and don't like just things. rush mm. because you have had the pain and you have had that mention about the scan the then mri just the rush and, and then you have the pain <laughs> and then you say i've come to do laparoscopy for, for what, what? no <laughs> <laughs> don't do that yeah. go see a doctor mm. a doctor will take the history and make a periodic examination mm. and then make a proper recommendation is for you mm. Mm. then um i would want to ask yes. how 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 what complications mm. actually what complications come with uh, besides the fibroids and the endometriosis and um, what else did you talk about the adhesions and scarring and all that mm -hmm. what other complications come with dysmenorrhea dysmenorrhea definitely a complication dysmenorrhea is pain mm -hmm. so the, that discomfort of feeling pain it can become so disturbing mm -hmm. I, imagine now let's give a proper example mm -hmm. <laughs> we are at a TV discussing something and then you are in pain, mm. that discomfort can't be very good. It can make you underperform mm. in the first case. It is a discomfort mm. in the first case. So the pain, there is no pain which is good for that sake. Okay, if it is, if it is beyond being managed. Yeah, if it's unbearable. Mm. Yeah, if it's unbearable, sincerely. That discomfort is not good mm, for that sake. So it should be managed. Should be to some people, the pain is minimal mm. and it's bearable. By the some people just manage it without taking it, uh, taking any medication, mm. and that would be very good. Actually, if you can avoid medication. taking medication, mm. that's the best, because the more you take uh, these medications, the more they'll have effects on your body with time to with come. Time. You may not have prompt effects, mm. but you see, when you take in these medications we are overburdening our liver. Mm. It's the liver which has the responsibility of eliminating all these medications. All these medications. Mm. So you may not have a problem now, but in the future you may find yourself having problems with the liver and the kidney. Mm. So if you can manage using other means, by the way, there are other means you can use to manage this mild pain, if it's not severe. Mm. You can avoid taking these medications mm -hmm. and then do exercise like I've been talking about. Mm. You can take a warm bath mm. it can help you also relief on the pain mm -hmm. uh, you can use a, a home pad a, at least you put on your pelvic area not something so hot but talking about warm, warm. yes mm. to relieve of the pain you can choose to lie with your knee folded mm. or legs up you can also get some relief mm. You can do some exercises and yoga trying, not, not necessarily trying to be physically fit. But something yeah. to relieve. I think the exercises help uh, improve the blood flow. Yeah, exactly. And when that happens, the pain is relieved. Yes. And then some supplements, not necessarily medications, mm -hmm. but some supplements. If you took beta, vitamin B1, mm. vitamin B6, mm. uh, omega-3, yeah, those can help you, calcium and magnesium. They can also help relieve Where do you get pain. the supplements? You just go and buy them. That's why it's or still, still you need to do every kind <laughs> of thing you need to do. Because I am thinking if if I go in and buy a supplement and mm. maybe let's say my body has a high level of calcium mm. and me I'm here bombarding myself with calcium supplements. Mm. That's why we tell then you it that also becomes a problem. You need to do whatever you do under the guidance of a doctor, a doctor. Yeah, because the doctor will have different take some history your history mm, ask you some question maybe even make some investigations before he mm. makes such recommendations mm. so our viewers shouldn't rush to do anything but they should rush mm. to their doctors to their doctors to and guidance proper guidance <laughs> <laughs> okay mm. now i was going to ask mm. in the case of endometriosis mm. how severe is that pain because that's I, I imagine th that's quite a hard question. I <laughs> okay. I I imagine mm. you like you said, uh, it is a deposit of the uterine uterus lining mm. in different parts of the body. Mm. Now I imagine let's say my entire stomach pelvic, a pelvic area has mm. deposits of you know mm. of um, of the uterus lining. Mm. And now I have uh, secondary or primary dysmenorrhea, mm. and then it also kicks in mm. actually 
when does the endometriosis pain come? Does it also come on the cycle, or it, for it, it can come, it can present itself anytime? It can present itself anytime because of the underlying, the causing, the causing factor. Mm. Because it can be there, because this endometriosis is serious. By the way, is still, just like you talked about, I think it can also cause infertility. Mm. Because it should do this lining still go and grow over the ovaries. Mm -hmm. Then it means these follicles cannot develop into mature eggs, mm. and then an egg may not be produced and you may not conceive. Yeah, yeah. So the pain may be related to the severity in the first case. Mm -hmm. But just like we said, there is no pain that we should think it is okay. Mm, it's yes, normal. It's normal. Mm. For that case, it shouldn't be something we should do. You say it is fine mm. Mm, in that case. It, it's not fine. It's not fine for that sake. Mm. Pain is pain and for endometriosis is not good for that sake. Mm. By the way, apart from endometriosis, there are other causes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm. Now like uh, cervical stenosis. Cervical? Stenosis mm -hmm. is another condition which may cause the pain during the menstrual period. And uh, this is where the cervix is narrow. Mm. In that uh, the flow of the menstrual blood yes. is limited. So if there is no proper menstrual flow, it will exert pressure on the uterus mm. and definitely result into pain. pain. Yes. Okay. Yes. Mm. And then there's another condition you call the adenomyosis. Mm -hmm. Adenomyosis, this is uh, another condition where still the uterine lining mm -hmm. grows into the tissue into the tissue of the uterus of the uterus and in that case it causes an inflammation uh. and definitely pain so those are two other causes of the, the wow. secondary of the secondary dysmenorrhea exactly so if we don't rule out that dysmenorrhea in its primary stage mm. chances are when it gets to the secondary stage it could even be bad mm. or worse yeah you not uh, it is not a primary which progresses into secondary. secondary. The mode. secondary presents itself on its own? And there are different causes completely. Oh. Different causes. Because remember in the first case we are looking at the chemical prostaglandin That's which was being most pro yeah, more responsible for the for primary the pain. Mm. And for the pain. So in the secondary but now we are looking at these are actual abnormalities. These are medical conditions. Mm. Yet in the first case it was a exactly. normal pain which was caused by the other chemical because obviously the uterus has to contract to expel them out mm. but in this case it's not all about the expulsion of the lining of the uterus mm. or and the over but mm. because of other medical abnormalities which are causing the pain the pain yes mm. so they are completely different in the cause the time they th they take and even the severity of the pain is different is different mm. Mm. So what treatment can be given in a few minutes? What treatments besides, mm. uh, or what examinations should someone frequently go for mm. to find out these things? Because like you said, someone might be fine mm. and they don't go through the primary dysmenorrhea and they are well. Mm. Then out of the blue, mm. the secondary dysmenorrhea comes. Actually, not confusing other condition with dysmenorrhea. Mm. It is very important. That when you're having such pain, at least you try as much as you can to go and see a doctor. If it is possible, you do some other investigation, do a urinalysis, mm. yeah, to, to see whether it is not, yeah, to rule out the UTI, UTI or other infections. Or other infection. It's better to do a, a scan mm. and see where what could be the possible cause of the pain. Maybe you have fibroids. And then we talked about the laparoscopy. Mm. We need to look into the cavity, mm. uh, the pelvic cavity, and see whether there's some ad adhesions and scarring. Mm. Because treatment will definitely be appropriate when you get to the real cause of what the problem is. But once you begin trying blindly, then you may not get proper treatment. Okay, talking mm. about adhesions and mm. scarring. Mm. Do those scars that, that come in as a cause of the inflammation you talked about that comes and then causes the scars on the organs or the attachment and mm. all that, mm. how do you treat them? How do you treat them? Actually, that's why we talked about the surgical procedure because those, mm. if they have been scarring and attachment and adhesions, then for them to be set free, fine, you can, we can use some other medications, but mm. in the case it fails to do, that could be another option we should look at. Mm. But just like we talked about, we using the non-steroidant uh, 
inflammatory drugs, mm -hmm. we can begin with them. And then upon recommendation by your doctor, you can use some oral contraceptives. Mm -hmm. Also, they can help. help yeah, to some extent. Mm. But in case things fail, then you need to seek further medical advice from your doctor. Mm. Yes. You know, many times I always don't want to <laughs> give medications on, on TV or on yes, air. Yes, it's, it's not right. But people pick, somebody will pick it and then <laughs> do it the contrary. And, and quickly so run. So I always advise them to go and see their mm. physicians. Mm. I know they will get them properly. Okay. Mm. Okay. As uh, our time is running so fast, mm. but I have a few questions. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, these ones we talked about. What type of birth control methods help control dysmenorrhea? Mm. I think that one, the doctor mentioned, he talked about it. Mm. Uh, what kind type of medications can be used to treat dysmenorrhea caused by endometriosis? Mm. Yes. Mm. And that's what I've been explaining now mm. exactly. Those are the things we should look at. I think at. they're the same, yeah. Yeah, they're the same. Mm. Mm. Okay. Mm. I think this, this, the questions that people are, are sending are more of the same. I think some of them started catching us late. Okay. But they are the same. Mm. But in case you have any other question that you would want to send in, please send it in. And if we have time on us, we'll be answering. If not, we'll be answering your questions on our Facebook page. Uh, that's on Rest TV. When is uterine <laughs> artery em eh? embolization, embolization done to treat dysmenorrhea? <laughs> now, this must be a medical person. Yes. You can't ask <laughs> such a question. <laughs> First of all, what is it? Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know. What it is, mm. this is a medical procedure mm. where the doctor or the physician mm. blocks the blood vessels that are supplying blood mm. to the fibroids in that case mm. because once they are supplied with the blood mm -hmm. they will grow and develop they grow bigger and the condition becomes severe mm. but what the embolization does is to cut off the blood supply so that these mm. things shilling and die off Okay. Yes, yeah. that's what it is. So means. that is a procedure that can be done actually, yes. alternatively for fibroids? Yes, it's a same procedure which can be done. Without necessarily going for a surgery, a major surgery? Mm. Mm. Yes, it can be done. Eh, whoever asked, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, and what, uh, how, what complications are associated with that procedure? With associated complications with that procedure, somebody can get infections for such. Uh, infection is this is like introduction of uh, a foreign organism bacteria into the body. Mm. So in the, the process of that, somebody can get some infections and mm. that cannot be something good. Mm -hmm. Then the pain, definitely some mild pain, mm. which is associated with that. Mm. And uh, other complication is bleeding. Mm. Yeah, somebody may have bleeding for some time. Mm. Mm. Okay, mm. but besides that, it's some simple, nice procedure. Yes, it's a procedure which does not take one a lot of time. It's mm -hmm. not a, a major surgery. You can it's walk in and walk yes, out and go back to work. Yes, it can be an OPD procedure. Ah. Mm, you come, it's done, then you go away. Oh, mm. okay. We, our time is fast <laughs> spent. <laughs> we can't go on beyond <laughs> this. Uh, we have questions, but we're going to be answering them. The doctor is going to be online answering your questions. Uh, we'll catch you next week. I think we'll have a continuation of this because this is kind of a big topic mm -hmm. and we've not exhausted everything. So we'll catch you next week with a continuation. Keep the questions coming in and you'll surely answer. You have a blessed day.